According to new data released by Syracuse University, the IRS continued the historical trend of hassling primarily low-income taxpayers while auditing very few millionaires and billionaires last year. According to the report, the taxpayer class with five and a half time, uh, times the audit rates as other classes was low-income wage earners taking the earned income tax credit. Joining us now to discuss is associate editor at Reason Magazine, Liz Wolf. Good to see you again, Liz. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Yes, uh, nice to have you back after your uh, you were been on maternity leave. Congratulations, new mother. Excited for you. Thank you. Um, okay, so talk to us about this story, um, which I saw getting a lot of uh, pickup. Actually, I think Drudge picked it up. Uh, what was the deal here? Yeah, so basically this was information released um, about who the IRS went after in 2022. I think lots of people have made the very good point that the $80 billion infusion in new funding, which is going to be doled out over the next decade, hasn't really gone into effect yet. But I would I would argue that, you know, these funds are fungible and uh, these agencies sort of know what to anticipate in the future. And so they ought to be gearing up to use that money. Uh, but I think the fact of the matter is, when uh, that money was initially uh, designated to go toward the IRS, there was a huge news cycle where basically the Biden administration kept claiming that households making under $400,000 a year would absolutely not be hurt by this. This would not be uh, an increase in the audit rate for middle income people and low income people. But we we know that that's just not true. They The IRS consistently goes after people claiming the earned income tax credit. They consistently go after the poorest possible earners. And the reason for this is it's a question of incentives. They use correspondence audits, which are audits by mail, to go after poor people. Um, it's a whole lot harder to get millionaire and billionaire fat cats, and they don't have that many resources, so they choose not to. And so everything you said there is absolutely true. It's disgusting. The correspondence audits are basically low-hanging fruit. The easier kind of audits and the people who get caught up in them, to your point, are disproportionately poor, disproportionately black people. The, the most audited district or, or county, rather, in the country is this little uh, town in, in Mississippi that 50 uh, percent of the people who live there uh, are poor enough to take advantage of the earned income tax credit. So it's a really terrible situation. But what some people have been arguing is that the situation was less grim 10 years years ago when IRS funding was actually higher. And the reason for that is that the more sophisticated kinds of audits that are required to go after higher income earners who have, you know, lawyers and accountants who can exploit all kinds of loopholes, et cetera, re requires more highly trained agents than the agency has been able to afford. And because of the pivot to these kind of lower hanging fruit type investigations as a consequence of funding cuts over the last 10 years, what we've seen is that over the last 10 years, audits of the rich have gone down from 16 percent to just 2 percent in 2019. Uh, what, what do you say to people who want those audit rates for the rich to go back up? I rate this claim sort of partly true. You are correct that um, the distribution of who the IRS audited did look really different about 10 years ago and even 15 years ago because of funding differences. However, I think there are a few things we need to consider here. Number one, the IRS is trying to hire a whole bunch of new agents. The CBO is estimating that it's going to take about three years of ramp up time for senior agents uh, who are more experienced. OK, for the more junior agents that they're hiring, it's going to take even longer than three years. So we're talking about this infusion of cash that's happening now, but it might be three years, four years, five years, six years until we actually see the effects of that. Um, so I think it's important to be a little skeptical of their estimates about how much revenue they'll bring in. I also think it's important to keep turning back to this idea that the U.S., in terms of the tax gap, when compared to other countries, especially other OECD countries, we actually don't have that much of a gap between what is owed and what is actually collected by the IRS. Fundamentally, I think a lot of people believe this narrative about millionaires and billionaires who squirrel away their wealth and uh, find lots of creative ways to hide it. And of course they do. Like to some degree, that is something that is happening. They have an incentive to do so and they have the means to do so. They will always be able to hire the best lawyers and accountants to be able to help them um, you know, creatively move their wealth uh, in order to avoid being stuck with a huge tax bill. However, we aren't that bad tax gap wise, all things considered. I think we're on par with Japan's tax gap. Um, so I think it's important for people to always true back to that and realize that this is not 
uh, an enormous problem in the U.S. compared to other countries. Well, just to address that point, Liz, I'm sorry, Ravi, but I happened to have done my radar on this yesterday, so I had some numbers on hand. The U.S. Treasury loses about $160 billion each year in taxes owed by the richest Americans, the top 1%, who are getting audited at lower and lower rates. So I take your point that, of course, ramping up this program is going to take a ramp up, it's going to take time, but isn't it important for rich people to have to pay their fair share in taxes and for that money, which is enough to almost fund the entire Department of Housing and Urban Development, hardly a paltry sum, to actually be collected so that rich people aren't getting by without paying their fair dues, while poor people are the ones that are still being targeted, regardless of how long it takes to implement the program to restore balance. I think you might be more optimistic than I am about the amount of revenue that can be collected here. And so uh, well, I'm just, that's I'm just quoting the only right. authorities that we have on this. Well, yeah, so I'm going to look at the, the federal government's record in this. And if you look at uh, during the Obama era, when he implemented FATCA, which basically went after frequently expats uh, foreign bank accounts in order to have them declare that, um, you know, there were estimates for how much revenue that would generate. And it ultimately generated like a third of what they had claimed. Uh, and so, I mean, you can go back through the numbers of this. You, you might still say that's a justifiable, reasonable approach for the Obama administration. But, you know, I'm not too impressed when the revenue estimate is one thing and then the actual amount that is collected is a third of that. And so that's the situation that I think could possibly happen here. Isn't it the case that um, tax revenue in the U.S. hovers around like 20 percent of GDP regardless of changes in policy or what gets done or what happens. It's like it always ends up being about the same and that can, you know, confounds people like, oh, we should do it this way. We should do it this way. This was a bad year. This was a better year. But it always ends up being about 20 percent of GDP. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's really uh, quite wild if you, I, you know, uh, legislators have experimented with changing like the wealth tax in the past and sort of rejiggering that in order to collect different amounts of revenue. Uh, they've experimented with different funding levels for the IRS. I think you and I both sort of agree, Robbie, like fundamentally at the end of the day, we have a pretty incompetent agency uh, with a whole bunch of incompetent mm -hmm. people. And you could point to lack of funding or lack of good incentives, like maybe they're simply not paying people highly enough to attract the most competent people. But I mean, fundamentally, you look at uh, the fact that taxpayer information has been hacked, the fact that taxpayer information has been leaked to ProPublica. This is not a super modernized agency that does really smart things uh, in terms of data security. Uh, and I think it's very fair for people to sort of wonder, OK, well, they're not doing a good job of protecting our data. They're not doing a good job of providing customer service. We're often playing a guessing game in terms of how much we owe. I keep coming back to the idea that simplifying the tax code would be the better approach that we could take instead of attempting to wade through uh, this really miserable process of constantly haggling over how much money What about just informing gets? people what they actually owe and then having them pay that instead of having to use, I'm sure, the, you know, the tax collecting company, H&R Block type organizations love being obligated to help you think this through. Um, it seems like a massive you know, giveaway to that entire industry. But maybe yeah. we could actually just tell people what they owe. Absolutely. I mean, that's the policy that they use. That's the approach they use in tons and tons of other countries. And I think it's a little bit of like frequently a sort of like leftist talking point of like, oh, well, that's how they do it in Europe and like applied to all kinds of different things like single payer health care, for example. But like legitimately, why don't we look to how other countries do it <laughs> and possibly consider creating a more simplified tax code? Because yeah, I actually think there's a, the day, a lot of well, agreement the on that. Mm -hmm. I have the free time and the ability to figure out what I owe in taxes, but a much poorer person does not. Yeah, I think there's a lot of agreement about that. No, no problems there. I think the problem that people are having is the idea that by not addressing the problems with the IRS that you articulated so well just a minute ago, you're just codifying, you're locking in a system where these poor people are still getting over audited. The IRS isn't going anywhere. And at the same time, these rich people who only get audited when the IRS have more funding are getting left off the hook. And people are looking at the fact that people pushing this bill earn on average 12 times more than the average American. Congress is filled with millionaires, uh, multi-millionaires. And they are the ones that are backing this program that basically ensures that people like them and their donors don't get audited, audited as much as people in Humphrey, uh, Mississippi. So what do you do about the people in Humphrey, M Mississippi, who defund the IRS, defund this, this $87 uh, million, a billion, sorry, the, the, new, the new inflection of cash that just came through in the omnibus bill? They're still on the hook, while rich people are not. What's to be done about that? 
Well, two things. First of all, I love that you talked about uh, how many people in Congress are multimillionaires. I think about like Bernie Sanders and Nancy Pelosi, and it like legitimately uh, leaves me a little confounded in terms of like, you know, pretending to be a man of the people. And, you know, that's not always quite the case. Bernie Sanders, um, who, to be clear, earned $2 million from the sale of his book while in his 70s. Sure, but sure, please go ahead. And, and Nancy Pelosi, I, I who have, is a multimillionaire have, many times over, I think over $100 million as a consequence of doing stock trades and things like that. But but please. We can do a whole segment on Bernie Sanders sometime soon. Uh, that would be absolutely delightful. Um, no, but I mean, to your point, I think you're, you're claiming that in the current system, no millionaires are audited. That's not quite true. Uh, we do have a significant chunk of millionaires who are audited under the current level of IRS but funding. many fewer than the but poor, I which think, is the whole point well, here, right, well, Liz? Well, hold on. But I also think it's important to consider, like, your your hypothesis is that poor people, people taking advantage of the earned income tax credit, will be audited at a different rate given the new infusion of IRS funding. No, no, I Under the status quo, that. Liz, under the status quo, poor people are already getting over audited. The infusion of money yeah. is supposed to correct it so that rich people get audited, too. So yeah. what do we do yeah. about that and imbalance? Am, hold on. And what I am saying is that I don't think that there will actually be a difference between, uh, you know, how poor people are targeted in 2021 and 2022 versus in 2024, 2025, 2026, because fundamentally, this is still a question of incentives for the IRS. They are looking to go after the low hanging fruit. And I'm not entirely sure why an infusion of cash would make it so that they suddenly don't go after that low hanging fruit. It might be a both and situation where they go after poor people and they go after millionaires and billionaires at a higher rate. But I think it's going to be easier for them to continue to conduct these correspondence audits. And I also think that if they were actually serious about their talking point that people making under $400,000 a year would not see an increase in their audit rates, then they should have codified that into law. But they chose not to, despite the fact that we had a huge news cycle where we haggled over this. They had the option to do so. They could have enshrined this and they chose not to. And to me, that indicates something very concerning. Yeah, that's uh, a great, that's a great point, that, Liz. That's a great point, Liz. I think Republicans and Democrats, if they really mean what they say, should definitely come together for bipartisan uh, legislation to make sure that IRS funding does maybe, come. Maybe they can now that they'll actually be able to discuss it on the House, House floor. Right. We'll be uh, and, actually and allowed to have discussions so about that, things So that again. millionaires and billionaires don't get completely let off the hook. Thank you so much, Liz. Thanks, guys. More Rising for you right after this.